Hello everyone. I think we're back up and running again. Uh, and I, I think Shannon's probably uh, following around uh, to let us know. So I guess you could consider that a two-part series or something, uh, couldn't you? But uh, uh, when we finished, we were talking about ownership. So just be sure to check the law of the land, the country, wherever you may be. Um, uh, for what you can and can't do if you find meteorites uh, from that standpoint. So um, uh, so you could collect Antarctica meteorites. It would be a fairly small collection, uh, just a few pieces, and in most, most uh, generally just small, tiny fragments are available from them. Um, and... Uh, other areas of collecting might be, uh, let's say, a typeset. Let's say you you collect um, a stony meteorite, an iron meteorite of any size, and a beautiful, beautiful palisite. Okay, you can see the crystals on that. Those olivine crystals. Okay and uh, you can collect that. That would give you the three major types. And then you could always move on to uh, a piece of Mars. Yeah, a piece of Mars. Or a piece of the lunar surface in a lunar meteorite with all those fragments in it. Uh, so you'd be able to touch a piece of the moon or Mars, or Vesta, and uh, with Vesta having three different types of meteorites, uh, it makes it kind of uh, a little neat collection, uh, you might say. Um, you could collect um, fragments of the largest meteorites on the planet, and uh, this is actually a shale fragment. So that's an oxidized iron meteorite or fragment. Uh, and this particular one is from the 60 ton largest meteorite on Earth, Hoba, that is in Namibia. H-O-B-A, uh, Hoba. And uh, as you can see, this one has some uh, desiccant in between it. I've got to change it out. It's been a while. Uh, that's a neat thing with desiccant. It changes from yellow to this blue-green color so that you know uh, it's time's expired. But um, uh, you could collect meteorites uh, based on meteorite size um, and uh, not so much uh, type. Um, you could also collect, uh, and this is a little bit further down the line maybe, but uh, this is a microscopic slide that has a thin section on it, uh, very thin, and you can use this under a microscope and look at all of the internal features of a meteorite. Uh, if you use a couple of cross-polarized lenses from a camera and put this in between them and turn them with light emanating from underneath of the slide, the colors of the minerals that will appear will impress. It's art. It is literally art. And uh, actually taking a photograph of one of these and turning it into a canvas print and putting it on your wall, people would say, wow, who did that? And uh, where did that come from? And you could tell them the asteroid belt. So um, thin sections are available for a wide variety of meteorites uh, in all price ranges. So keep that in mind uh, as you move forward in your um, collection. Uh, let's see, what else have I got? Uh, you could collect unique meteorites. This is one I showed you last week that has all these metal blobs that's a carbonaceous chondrite, part of that family, and um, it's unique. It's a fascinating meteorite um, with all of these blebs of metal and chondrules and everything that are in it. 
Um, so you could collect unique meteorites. Here's another one. This one's Portellus Valley. And uh, this one, as you could see, trying to get it just right here, has veins of metal in it. And sometimes it has very large pieces of metal in it. Uh, this is very th a very thin slice, about a millimeter thick, so it's in a, a case that'll keep it secure, as you can see. But uh, it's another very unique meteorite when it is sliced like this, just like those two. So um, one of my favorite areas to collect uh, are historic meteorites. And um, they offer um, quite a bit because uh, they're in the infancy of meteoritics, the science of meteorites. And um, one of those is, now I'm probably uh, going to butcher this, but it's uh, Anschensheim, so 1492. This is a fragment of the first recorded meteorite to fall in, to fall, and this one fell in France. Um, this one was actually put in a bird cage at one point, so it wouldn't escape uh, the entire stone. And uh, uh, now it's on display in the city, uh, the big piece of it. But uh, imagine having something going all the way back to Columbus's discovery of a of the Americas, and um, so it has a lot of history with it. There's a lot of history that deals with um, political upheaval with this, um, you know, battles and things like that. Um, as the empires changed hands through the centuries. So um, kind of nice just to have a little piece of that one and um, or a larger piece of it would even be fine. Um, one of the next ones that kind of falls in line is a uh, Wold Cottage in England that fell in uh, 1795. It was an observed fall. Uh, Edward Topham, as you can see there. And on the site, a few years later, they erected a monument. And that's a, a little chip of the meteorite right there, 1795. Okay. At this time, people felt that these were still uh, uh, thunderstones, and um, uh, say a couple of hellos. Hello, Tracy. Hello, Mike. Hey, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, they thought that they came from Mount Vesuvius out of the clouds, so that they were called thunderstones and aerolites, and uh, that's A-E-R-O-L-I-T-E-S. Um, aerolites and things like that, so uh, they really didn't know if, where they came from uh, at first. And uh, But Wold College is certainly another major historic uh, meteorite. This is a slice of it so that you can see the, the fresh interior of this chondrite. Uh, December 13th, 1795. Now, along with a slice of the meteorite, I have a picture of the monument. Uh, I have ephemeral items, including a piece of one of the bricks that was removed from the monument when it was restored years ago. And so I, this has been with the monument since it was built until now. And so if I wanted to, I could display it uh, with the meteorite, or I could frame it. Um, people do all different kinds of things. Um, and then just to show you, uh, this is um, the dealer's specimen card, which includes a lot of information so that it's very well documented. And added to this, you might want to uh, put your cost on it so that your family would be aware of it. Um, create a maybe an Excel spreadsheet or even a, a paper inventory of the meteorites you have with the cost and the date you acquired them and everything else, uh, which would all be very important information as time goes on.
Now, following that up, we have uh, Legla. Legla from France again. This fell April 26th, 1803. 1803, and this has fusion crust on it uh, that you can see there. It's a little oxidized. Uh, this one I don't handle too much. Uh, it's a historic meteorite. Uh, they're all historic, I guess. This is seven and a half gram specimen of it. And um, what is interesting with this is I have a volume here that contains uh, Jean-Baptiste Bayat's um, write-up of the meteorite, although in a language that I can somewhat make out but cannot fluently read, so it contains his entire story. Uh, this was published in 1804, so just a year after the meteorite had fallen. Uh, he was very meticulous in documenting uh, the fall of this meteorite. Uh, he even went out and got uh, first-hand reports from people that either heard something or saw it fall. And if I can, I will share with you the engraved map of the strewn field, that ellipse there that you could see. Uh, around that area, uh, he's identified a, a number of things, and it looks a little dark, I guess. Oops, if I come over this way. There we go. So that ellipse you can see. But this is all, believe it or not, from 1804. And uh, these ephemeral type items make great additions uh, to collecting. Uh, sometimes it'll take years to find uh, certain things. Uh, uh, Chelyu Binks that fell in 2013 in Russia. Um, a photographer was out that day, and um, he was on the lake and saw these images in the sky. Not exactly sure what to make of it. But he was witnessing history. And so later, these are called carrots, by the way. That's a meteorite on top of it. So um, later he created this set of postcards to document the fall of Chelyu Banks. And that's uh, the large hole that was created by the main mass as it came in. And they've recovered that mass, and that is placed in uh, the National Museum there. So, but uh, it well documents it. And uh, so things like that you can collect at the time. Newspapers, oh boy, newspapers are a great source because uh, they contain all of the uh, first-hand information usually. Uh, again, you have to be sure that you're reading in between the lines uh, to get to it. But um, historic falls for me have uh, always been uh, fun uh, with all the history that goes behind them. Uh, for the United States in 1807 in Weston, Connecticut, another December meteorite. For some reason, they all hover around my birthday. What can I say? Uh, this is a, almost a five gram specimen of the Weston meteorite that you could see there, and it has fusion crust. Benjamin Silliman was the, uh, the scientist that worked up this one, following very much so the fall of 1803 in gathering information. And just in the last couple of years, a book was released, uh, which is a good read called A Professor, A President, and a Meteor. And um, it's one that you'd want to pick up and read. Uh, fascinating read, talking about the fall, uh, what the president thought at the time, uh, the works, because remember that uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson was also a scientist, 
so uh, his interpretation of what was going on uh, is also an interesting read uh, with that. Um, coming into the meteorites that I just showed you are the uh, birthplace of the science that was taking place at the time as to where the stones were coming from and uh, changing the thought of the public that these stones were actually coming from our solar system, uh, from the asteroid belt in outer space. Uh, and then with the scientists thinking about how all that's occurring, that they're not being thrown out of volcanoes or coming, coming out of thunder clouds uh, at the time. So, um, and uh, one of the greatest mysteries uh, still today uh, occurred in 1908 in Russia, um, Tunguska. Tunguska flattened a forest. We still don't know whether it was a, common, a comet or a meteor uh, that came in and flattened the forest. And that and caused some burning and very loud detonation explosions and things like that. Well, ever since that time, uh, the area in Tunguska has been well documented in photographs, in firsthand stories of the residents that live there, um, in taking cross sections out of uh, the trees. And um, this is one of the experiments from one of the um, one of the surveys from not that long ago but uh, they've marked here with an arrow and dots the line when Tunguska came in through the atmosphere and exploded above the surface of the earth um, there aren't any meteorites that can be found uh, that we know of. Perhaps they all disintegrated. Um, maybe it was a comet uh, that completely disintegrated before it hit the ground. But um, this bears uh, the official seal and everything uh, so that we know. But um, it is a nice um, piece of history um, for meteoritics uh, right there. So, uh, um, with that, um, I hope that, um, uh, this 45 minutes has been enjoyable and I apologize for the, um, the restart here. Uh, something you have to do with technology. Uh, it's not perfect, uh, but it, it does work. Um, but in my mailbox this week, um, one of the first falls of 2020 arrived. This one from Kenya. Um, this is Gay 2 and it is an ordinary chondrite, which most of them are that come in. Uh, this is a fragment of an entire fall that was around 25 kilograms, 25 kilograms. Uh, it's an L6 chondrite, uh, so there are no chondrules left in it. Um, and this is an 18 gram specimen. Um, it has fresh velvety fusion crust. And if I turn it just right, you can see the fresh white matrix. This has shock veins running through it. So you can see lines of melt, uh, which would are very fine uh, black lines uh, going through the meteorite. And um, this was picked up before the rain started. So this is a very fresh specimen, should remain nice and crisp with a white interior um, for most of its life, unless it gets moisture at all. Uh, with that black brown velvety crust but um, uh, one of the latest falls and sometimes people try to collect every meteorite that falls or has been found and things like that and 
it's almost an impossible task. Um, you could collect um, one from each century. You could collect all of them from your birth year. Um, you could collect only 21st century uh, falls, uh, which would be a few stones a year, most generally. Uh, some of them very difficult to get because some are only a single rock. And perhaps uh, the house that it penetrated, that it fell through its roof, the owners decided to keep the entire piece. Um, so you may not be able to come up with those meteorites. Maybe you can only get the micro, or maybe you can get a cut slice, or maybe you can get a, a fragment that's representative. Um, but whatever your collecting interests might be, um, always try to get, as they say, the best you can get. Um, but enjoy your collection, study your collection, uh, record your collection, um, and then share it. Uh, I get perhaps the most joy out of sharing my collection with each of you. Uh, sharing the collection from the Abrams Planetarium uh, during our public events or even if you stop in and want to see a couple of meteorites. Um, that is where the joy comes from in all the new people that you meet. Uh, everyone has a story. Um, everyone likes to um, uh, hope that they find uh, perhaps a specimen of a past meteorite or wait for a new fall from a new meteorite. Um, but uh, whatever the case may be, um, I wish you the best in finding what you like um, and or sharing that with your family, your grandkids, your kids, um, the neighbors. I know that uh, the staff at Abrams Planetarium loves sharing the sky with everyone who comes to our facility and, uh, you know, has even hosted events and things like that. So, um, you know, always be sure to share. And I think that's the big takeaway. Uh, soon, hopefully, once we open back up, uh, we're a little bit behind on our new exhibit on Michigan meteorites and meteorites throughout the solar system. Um, uh, later today, I'm going to continue actually doing some work on the wall so we can get the wallpaper up uh, for the new exhibit. But uh, we look forward to sharing our collection with you in the near future uh, and uh, opening back up so that we can once again greet you. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd invite you to take a look at everything that the Abrams Planetarium Facebook page may have to offer through the week. Uh, there's celestial story time. Uh, there's astronomy in your backyard. There are experiments that can be done and things like that. And as with all organizations like ours, um, we have not seen the public in a couple of months. And uh, we would ask if you're so inclined that you donate. And Shannon uh, has put a link on our Facebook page uh, for donations. And uh, they certainly help with our programming and everything and getting things up and running. Or consider subscribing uh, to um, our sky calendar that comes out once a month. And that's a $12 investment for the year. Uh, it's not much at all. But uh, every little bit helps at this time of uh, uh, budget tightening and that because of the impact uh, that uh, this virus has had on us. Uh, next time, uh, you're gonna join us from uh, Abrams Planetarium. Uh, where I'll share with you uh, some of the Michigan meteorites. Uh, we have 11 out of the 12 known meteorites um, that have either uh, seen to, been seen to fall in our state or been found uh, most generally in fields and things like that. 
but uh, we'll get to share uh, the stories of some of those meteorites with you uh, directly from the planetarium. Uh, so I look forward to uh, next week and us doing that. Again, don't forget about the space launch uh, that occurs at 4.30 today. Um, weather permitting, as always. Uh, be sure to check that out. And until next time, keep your eyes to the skies. This is Craig Whitford with the Abrams Planetarium. Have a great day.